All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Today's topic is going to be something a little bit more educational, and that's going to be on how to ferment high gravity beers and how do you do it well. Anybody can ferment a high gravity wort, but when it comes down to it, is the beer that comes out of it actually good? Well, that depends on a couple things and how you treat your fermentation. So I want to share with you guys some of the tips and techniques that I use to make sure that my high gravity beers do come out tasting the way I want them to. And that is without sharp and harsh off flavors and with all of that nice complexity that you might get from your high alcohol beers. So without further ado, let's dive into it. So when I mean high gravity beers, I'm talking about 1065 to 1070 OG and up and on from there. Um, there's a gray area between like 1050 and 1065 where you can get away with just treating your fermentation properly and not pitching a ton of yeast, but anything north of 1070, you start running into some issues where your fermentation might crap out on you. You might start generating poor amounts of fusel alcohol. Sluggish fermentation might happen. Might not hit your final gravity. Your yeast might just need some, some extra help. In that situation, you can't just pitch your yeast, walk away from your fermenter, come back two weeks later and bottle. It just doesn't work like that. You need extra steps in there to make sure that everything goes exactly as planned. So the first thing that you need to do to make sure that your fermentation is healthy and successful is to pitch enough yeast in the first place and secondly to make sure that your yeast is indeed healthy vitalized and ready to go so that means not pitching directly from the yeast packet I'm sorry but in these situations it's pretty much mandatory to make a starter it's generally a good idea to make a starter anytime you're brewing because what that does is it creates vitalized yeast which are essentially woken up and ready to go instead of just yeast that's been sitting in a fridge dormant for a long time and then gets suddenly pitched into a high gravity wort like it, it's not good that creates stressed yeast or shocks the yeast and can cause some pretty nasty off flavors that are difficult to get rid of or downright impossible to get rid of so when you're making a starter i highly 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 recommend making sure that you know what your target pitch rate is and i highly recommend that you also calculate how many cells that you need for a successful fermentation my go-to yeast pitch rate calculator is on brewer's friend um, and I'm gonna link that down in the description if you're curious about it. A pitch rate is typically measured in terms of this metric. Millions of cells, referring to the yeast, per milliliter per degree Plato. Now, that's basically a fancy way of saying how many cells are in how much volume of beer in how strong of a wort. Now, uh, this calculator that I'm referencing will do all that calculation for you, so all you need to do is select your pitch rate. For example, I just brewed a Belgian dark strong ale with an original gravity of 1097, and that required a whole lot of yeast, especially considering that I was really pushing that yeast into a very hot fermentation. Uh, so in order to make sure that it was healthy, we needed a ton of yeast. So I targeted a pitch rate of about 1.0 uh, million cells per milliliter per degree Plato, which is a relatively high pitch rate for an ale. Although for a strong ale, it's actually relatively normal. So what that required was 500 billion cells of active yeast ready to go. That means that I needed to make a starter with a gravity of 1040 and about 200 billion cells of active yeast into it. So that means like one imperial packet, or if your yeast is a little bit old, maybe two. That's something you don't think about all the time. You tend to buy liquid yeast packs and leave them in the fridge until you need to brew, but check that manufacturer's date. Again, this yeast pitch rate calculator accounts for that. It will tell you if you need to add additional packs of yeast or just make a step up starter, which is a different technique. Either way, make sure you know exactly how much yeast you're gonna need for that gravity of wort. And that's probably the most important step that you could take into ensuring that you have a good high gravity fermentation. And please, for the love of God, don't pitch a yeast packet just straight into the wort without a starter when you're making a high gravity beer. Please don't. The second thing you need to do is further along in the brewing process, but still before you even pitch your yeast, and that is add yeast nutrient. I use it in every single brew that I make, and it is always a good thing. It helps the yeast get along, it helps them get additional nutrients that they need in order to have a successful and healthy fermentation. There's a couple different brands out there, for they do different things. I would recommend checking out this video here. This is The Brew Show. Uh, he has gone over different kinds of yeast nutrients and how to use them. It's a great overview of it, and that's all the information you're going to need to know about that. But the point is have yeast nutrient available and use it when you're making a high gravity wort. Your yeast will thank you. The third thing that you need to make sure of is after your boil is complete, when you've transferred into your fermenter and now you aerate the wort. Aerating the wort means that you're adding oxygen to the fermentation. Oxygen in the wort is critical during the first stages of fermentation where the yeast are rapidly multiplying and consuming sugars. The yeast will consume that oxygen and replace it with carbon dioxide, so it doesn't end up in the final beer. Oxygen after fermentation is a very bad thing and can stale your beer. But if the yeast is active in the fermentation, 
they will consume any oxygen that is available. That's why bottle conditioning works. But the point is, make sure that you have an adequate level of oxygen in the wort. For a wort that is about 1060 OG or lower, you can absolutely get away with just splashing the wort into the fermenter, creating a large amount of bubbles, or whipping it up with a, with a slotted spoon or something like that, just to get a good frothy amount of oxygen in there. Do that for about a minute, you'll be fine. With higher gravity worts though, you really should invest in oxygenating with pure oxygen. What you're gonna need is one of these welding tanks. Make sure, you're me make sure you read it and look at it because they come in different colors and they can be different gases. So make sure you're getting pure oxygen. Don't put propane into your brew by accident. You can get these little cylinders or you can go to an actual gas supply company and get a full, like a bigger oxygen tank if you want. Um, I just prefer to use these cylinders because they're easy to find and they don't require sitting around and waiting and talking to gas people. The second thing you're gonna need is an oxygen regulator and a carbonation stone. And it's a super cheap kit. You can get them on Amazon. I'm gonna link one down in the description box. Opening that regulator to full blast and letting it go through the carbonation stone into your wort is going to give you a phenomenally better fermentation uh, than just simply splashing it into the bucket or just shaking your bucket up. Especially for a high gravity wort, Doing that for about a minute to a minute and 15 seconds, depending on the gravity of your wort, is going to give you much, much cleaner fermentation and prevent the yeast from stalling out early. The third thing to be sure of is that you're controlling the temperature of the fermentation. In certain styles, like Belgian ales, for example, that I'm working through right now, you actually want that to free rise up to whatever the yeast really wants it to go to. Um, and you know, you might want to cap that at a certain point. Uh, be sure you know exactly what the operating temperatures of your yeast are but be ready to cap the fermentation temperature at the maximum range that that yeast can work with it. And if your yeast continues to get hotter past that range, it can start to generate some off flavors and some fusel alcohols, and that tends to happen a lot more readily with higher gravity worts. Yeast go absolutely ballistic trying to consume all of the sugars that are available in a high gravity wort. They oftentimes start generating a whole lot of off flavors, a lot more off flavors than uh, compared to lower gravity worts. So it's just a good idea to keep an eye on your fermentation temperature, control it if you can, and make sure you don't let it get out of hand. On the other hand too, make sure it doesn't get too cold because sometimes the high gravity wort, you're actually gonna exhaust the yeast and they can actually stall out, drop out before fermentation is complete. And this is actually pretty common with a high gravity wort. They can stall out relatively easily and give up basically. And sometimes they need a little bit of an extra push or a little bit extra motivation really just to continue to finish the job. And basically what happens if you leave those fermentable sugars in the wort and you bottle condition, you can have bottle bombs and over carbonation uh, later on down the road. The same thing can happen with the keg. You can have an overcarbonated beer. While your keg may not explode uh, like a bottle would, it still would leave a very foamy beer at the end of the process. And then it might end up being drier and stronger in alcohol than you expect. So just want to be sure that you don't stall your yeast. Now, if your yeast does stall, there's a couple things you can do to take care of it. And again, these are things that you probably should do anyway in a high gravity fermentation, even if your yeast hasn't stalled. And the easiest thing you can do is adding a yeast vitalizer. This is a separate compound from yeast nutrient. You can add yeast nutrient during your fermentation as well, but a yeast vitalizer is going to add a little bit extra of a kick to the yeast that are gonna wake them up, get them fermenting again, get them in solution again to get those last bits of fermentable sugars out. Another thing you can do is rouse your yeast. And if you have a bucket style fermenter, this is as easy as just rocking the fermenter back and forth gently. Make sure you don't get oxygen into it by splashing it or rocking it hard. Rock it gently, try to stir up some of the yeast that's probably fallen to the bottom of the fermenter, and do so without introducing oxygen or bubbles into the wort. Now, if you have a conical fermenter with a port on the bottom of it, you can actually hook up a CO2 line to the bottom and blast some CO2 up through the bottom of the fermenter. This will kick the yeast cake back into suspension, which oftentimes can actually restart fermentation if it's stalled. Uh, this is my preferred technique for finishing out the fermentation, especially in a higher gravity beer. And the last thing you can do if you're really having trouble with your fermentation and your yeast really just aren't playing, you probably didn't pitch enough, you might be able to get away by pitching some fresh yeast. Ideally, it's the same strain, but you can also pitch in different strains if you want different effects. Or if you're really feeling interesting and adventurous, you might want to pitch some bread in there and then you'll continue to ferment until the end of time. And basically pitching fresh yeast is definitely going to restart your fermentation. It's going to get those last sugars in there, um, but just be aware you're going to extend some time into your fermentation. You're going to add a little bit of extra time to the back of your fermentation uh, as this happens. That's basically all of my major techniques for making sure that your high gravity fermentations go as planned. But then we need to talk about a couple extra things here. And the first is be patient. High gravity beers almost never are at their peak after the typical fermentation timeframe of two to three weeks. 
high gravity beers almost always are gonna want to age out for a couple months usually before they start to taste really, really good. And be patient, let your beers actually get to that point. Yes, theoretically you can make an imperial stout, a barley wine, even a, a Doppelbach within two weeks and sort of have a drinkable beer, but you're really doing yourself a disservice. Let that thing age for a couple months and you're gonna be blown away about how much better it is. Just be patient, the beer will take care of itself. Like once your fermentation is done and you get it packaged and you just leave it away somewhere, at that point it's gonna have that magic ingredient of time which is gonna really make a big difference in the beer itself. And that is just something that's often ignored. I know I'm certainly guilty of it myself. I know many other home brewer YouTubers out there will crank out beers in a couple of weeks just fine. There's nothing wrong with that, but the best things come with time and patience. But at the end of the day, if you're making a big strong beer like this, just let it age. You'll be happy. Now, if you're aging it in a fermenter or you're leaving it in bulk, um, ideally, I'd recommend you get it off the yeast cake. That's a nice thing about having a conical for these sorts of things. You can transfer the beer off of the yeast cake into a keg or into another so sort of secondary fermenter if you want to, uh, just for extended bulk aging. Bulk aging tends to kind of speed up the aging process a little bit as opposed to bottling. Um, but at the same time, bottling means that you're able to taste it and test it as it goes along. Um, so there's pros and cons to either method, but I do prefer bulk aging myself. But if you leave it on the yeast cake for several months, you're gonna start to experience some off flavors. The typical one we think of is autolysis, which is not really a huge deal at the uh, homebrew scale. Really, it's only a big deal if you leave it in the fermenter for like a month or longer. On the pro scale, autolysis is a much bigger problem. Uh, basically though, if you taste like a weird kind of meaty flavor in your beer, um, that's autolysis and it's not a good flavor. I've experienced that before when I aged something for too long. It's not great, but um, if you can get it off that yeast cake and into packaging or into a keg or something else, then you're not gonna experience that at the homebrew scale and you don't really need to worry about it too much. So in the comments down below, let me know what your preferred techniques are. Did you learn something from this video? And if I missed something, please drop it in the comments section so we can all get a little bit smarter and learn. And if you like this video, please go ahead, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, comment and share as well. It helps make my channel a little bit more visible to the rest of YouTube and I really do appreciate it. And if you wanna support the channel, please go ahead, check out my uh, merchandise store where you can get this hoodie, also in a t-shirt design, and various other designs. Um, various other types of t-shirts that I think are interesting and fun, please go check them out. That's down below the description box. It's a great way to support me. I get about 30% of those profits from the sticker price, so it does help quite a bit. I also have a Patreon, and the Patreon supporters are making a huge difference for me. They're helping drive the production behind this channel and make it a better YouTube channel over time. And a huge thank you to all of them. I also have channel membership options available. It's $2 a month. You get a couple perks with that. Check out the join button that's next to the subscribe button if you want to check that stuff out. I also have an Amazon store where you can get all of the home brewing equipment that I use uh, that's available on Amazon. If it's on that store and it's available on Amazon, I have used it and I do fully endorse it. I'm not going to put anything on that store that I don't recommend in general, so you're going to be able to get that endorsement basically by checking out that store. If you want to follow me on more than just YouTube, I'm also available on Instagram as The Apartment Brewer. So check that out for some more frequent content updates than here. And last but certainly not least, if you are still here, a huge shout out to you, a huge thank you to you for watching to the end of the video. It means a lot to me. So until the next one, cheers.